Gates Summer Scale. Great. Ladies and gentlemen, have a great day. Better, yes. Um, where's the music? Where's the music? Okay. Good morning, everybody. Um, my name is Alexandra Pringle. I'm not Anita Anand, who was supposed to be here. She's not actually arriving until a little bit later today to do her own events. So I have great pleasure in being here with Kate Summerscale. It's a particular pleasure to me because I am, in fact, her publisher from the UK and um, had the great joy of publishing The Suspicions of Mr. Witcher. So Kate Summerscale is a writer who began her career as a book writer with a book called The Queen of Whale Kay, which was a very unusual account of an unusual woman. And it went into the bestseller list and it was shortlisted for prizes. And then she went on to produce a synopsis for a book called The Suspicions of Mr. Witcher, well, it wasn't called that then, I don't think. It didn't have the title quite. But um, it was sent round to a lot of publishers, and it was the most exciting account. And everybody went wild for it. And there was an auction. And Bloomsbury Publishing were the lucky winners of that auction. And Kate and I began work together. So in 2008, The Suspicions of Mr. Witcher was published. And it was what I would call a genre buster. It did something that no other nonfiction book had quite done before. And this is because it occupied two territories. On one hand, it is a work of scholarship, of very serious history. And on the other hand, it is a story which is akin to the best detective stories that anyone has ever read. So it went to the hearts of people who loved reading P.D. James and John le Carré and so forth, as well as people who loved reading s serious history of the 19th century. This book got the most incredible reviews, which included in the New York Times, fact and fiction do not so much blur as bleed into each other in the suspicions of Mr. Witcher. Summer scale accomplishes what modern genre authors hardly bother to do anymore, which is to use a murder investigation as a portal to a wider world. We're going to talk about that now, but first of all, I'm just going to say that that book didn't just get incredible reviews. It won the Samuel Johnson Prize for nonfiction. It's been made into a television series, a very popular television series, and the book has sold around 450,000 copies, which is completely extraordinary for a serious work of nonfiction. So you will understand why when we talk. So Kate is going to tell you now about the book, about the story and what it is. Thank you, Alexandra. Um, hello. I hope, can you hear me? Yeah. A little louder. Okay. Um, I uh, thi this this book centres around a particular murder case, a murder mystery that when I came across it, I'd never heard of before. Though uh, in its day, which was 1860 in mid Victorian England, it was an extraordinarily famous, notorious case. Uh, what happened was in the summer of 1860 a very well-to-do family in the English countryside woke to discover that the youngest child of the family, the heir, a little boy called Savile Kent, had gone missing from his cot in the nursery, a room that he shared with his nursemaid and his sister. Um, a huge search was launched in the house and, and the grounds. 
and eventually the little boy's body was found in an outside lavatory um, and he'd been horribly murdered, his throat had been cut. Um, he was only three years old. And it soon became apparent that the killer of the child was not a random gypsy, as was originally thought, but had to be somebody from within the household because he wind a window was found open that could only have been open from inside. Um, and so the suspicion fell on the servants and members of the boy's own family, who included a couple of teenage children, the father, um, the nursemaid, and uh, the, the, the family was a complex one in that the father, this was the father's second marriage, and so there were several children from the first marriage. Um, nonetheless, the local police failed to solve the crime in the fortnight after it was committed, and the newspapers were full of it, not only reporting the crime, but speculating on who might have done it and clamoring for a Scotland Yard detective to be sent to Wiltshire to investigate. And thus entered Mr. Witcher, um, who is the detective. And um, what is fascinating about this is the position of the detective in Victorian England at the time. So it would be wonderful if you talked a little bit about that. Um, the detective force in England was the first set force in the English-speaking world. It was founded in 1842 with just eight men. And Jonathan Witcher, Jack Witcher as he was known, was one of those men. So by 1860, he'd sort of risen to the top of this tiny elite squad and was known as the Prince of Detectives. And so he was absolutely a, a pioneer. He and his colleagues were making up detection as they went along. They were set la laying out what it was to detect, to be a plain clothes <laughs> investigating officer. And there were no precedents um, for them, apart from a few short stories by Edgar Allan Poe that were published at around the same time as the detective force began in London, and, um, and I, was, I was fascinated to know what their methods were and how they were perceived and, and understood what the detective was to a Victorian Englishman or woman. Um, and I sort of realized as I, um, as I read around the subject and read fiction from the time, including novels of Charles Dickens and Wilkie Collins, that in these early days, the detectives were seen as almost magical figures in some ways, like little gods who had, in this, it was very, it was around the time of uh, Darwin's publication of Origin of the Species, and the old sort of faith in, in God and religious belief was being overtaken by faith in, in new in scientific methodology and the detective in some way came to occupy the territory of a, of a priest or a seer as well as of a scientist. So it was a very strange, um, uneasy and sort of interesting kind of agglomeration of characteristics that were attributed to detectives. And when Jack Witcher went down to investigate this particular murder, it was probably the most high-profile case of the decade, and all the hopes of the nation were pinned on him. Um, it was perceived that the sort of clumsy local police with their old-fashioned methods had utterly failed to solve this very terrible and it was perceived as this important crime, um, and now it was the chance of the new man, Scotland Yard man, to to see if he, if he could resolve it. Um, what Witcher was down in this town road in Wiltshire for two weeks, and he quick, quite quickly identified a suspect, but he was unable in those two weeks to find the evidence to prosecute, convict. And so from 
moment when he went down to world tours as a hero, he became um, perceived as a terrible failure um, and, a, and villain who had invaded the families privacies, cast allegations on their probity, and it was an amazing turnaround from um, him having all these hopes invested in him to seeming as if uh, the, 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 the whole image of the detective collapsed with his failure. And can you talk a little bit about why that was and the position of the Victorian middle class family and the effects that that had on them? Yes, this was a, um, a, a really apparently anyway a very affluent um, Victorian family who lived in a beautiful house, the finest house in the village. And it was seen as really t terrible that Witcher, a working class man, as all the detectives, indeed all the police were, had presumed, even, th even though the public wanted him to solve the case, when it came to it, that he made his accusations, which centered on a, on, on a member of the family, um, and he demanded to see the underclothes and nightclothes of the young women in the family. This was to establish if there was any blood on them, if there were blood stains. Um, he, it suddenly, d everyone sort of turned on him and saw this as a, r a really disgraceful invasion of privacy and lack of respect, uh, as if the, the, something had gone wrong with the world order, with the hierarchy, that this upstart working class man could distress and, uh, and sully this respectable family. Uh, and at, at the time in, in England, in 1860, it was um, just before the death of Prince Albert, and Victoria and Albert were the apotheosis of the cult of the domestic bliss, of uh, the respectability of the English home, of the family, the respectable family as the the, the bedrock, the foundation stone of the whole empire. And so in a strange way, even though this was one particular murder story, one particular mystery, it went to the heart of the Victorians' conception of themselves and what, what, to what it was to be English and what it was to be respectable and private. Um, if Witcher had succeeded in, in solving the mystery by uh, conducting the, his investigation, it might have been different, but because of the pressure put on him and his inability to find a, two crucial pieces of evidence, a nightdress and the murder weapon, a knife, um, it, it seemed as if all he'd done was destroy and ca cast aspersions on this important symbol of Britishness without resolving anything. And did, um, did Mr. Witcher, do you think, change the nature of detection? And if so, what was it like before and how did it go from there? Well, he was um, a very intuitive detective. Um, he, I, I was lucky enough to discover that um, in the National Archives in London, there were, as a, a case file about this case has survived. Not many files have survived from this period. And Witcher's reports to the police commissioner um, in London were included in this file. There's pages and pages of them where he reports on what he was doing in, in Wiltshire, who he was interviewing, what his suspicions were and why, what he'd found. And um, this was, it, it gave me an extraordinary insight into his methods, the way his mind worked. And I realized that um, far from proceeding in a really strictly methodo methodological way, work, gathering his evidence and so on, he quite quickly um, intuited what had happened. He had a hypothesis and then he set out to to find the evidence to bolster it. And so what the way he worked was by reading behavior and character, expression, the way people spoke. It was through interviewing the family that he reached his conclusions. And um, this 
was, he had a sort of gift for this. As it, um, I, I referred earlier to the fact that he, his failure sort of blighted the whole image of the detective. But his failure was only apparent. Five years after the case, uh, the person who he had suspected confessed and it was clear that his reasoning and his understanding of the murder was correct in every particular. Um, by this time, though, he had had a nervous breakdown. Um, was some was referred to at the time as congestion of the brain, as if his obsession with this case had driven him mad, and he had retired from the police force. Um, so, but he was he was around. He 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 was he lived to to see himself vindicated and the terrible opprobrium and, and hatred really that had been heaped on him when um, the, in the year of the murder uh, was reversed. Um, and, and more than that, although he had left the police and, and didn't return to it, the fact of his vindication um, en enabled him to sort of restore himself in, in other ways. He married very soon after the confession of his suspect and he started a new career as a, what was known as a private inquiry agent, uh, a private detective, uh, which was a, a very new profession. Uh, m people mostly by the former detectives from the Metropolitan Police Force. So um, would it be right in thinking that in a way he was the beginning, he was the progenitor of all the detective fiction that we read and what we watch on television um, and all the, all, I don't know whether in India people are as obsessed as they are in the UK. Everyone is crazy about Scandinavian crime, long television series, and everyone has a m mystery at the heart of it. Would you say that Witcher was the beginning? Uh, yes, I, I, that was part of what initially interested me so much about this, this story, that in a way the murder mystery was the template for the novels of Agatha Christie, for example, where there's a closed society, whether it's an ocean liner or a hotel or a country house, um, where the suspects are a discrete number of people. And as the story unfolds, you discover that although only one or maybe more of them are the, are the, is, the is the murderer, that everyone in that house has something to hide. And that, that's what I found as, I, uh, that was th as the story unfolded, all kinds of dark secrets um, emerged about the family in, in which the little boy was killed. And Witcher himself became the prototype for Wilkie Collins' Sergeant Cuff in his novel The Moonstone, who was w one of the first d d detective heroes of sorts in English literature and he, the, the, the details of the plot of the Moonstone are partly drawn from the Road Hill house murder. Um, and so through Sergeant Cuff, which uh, has, was, was the sort of beginning of the whole tradition of the detective in English fiction um, and later Sherlock Holmes and, and so on, where through Miss Marple and... But one thing that um, struck me that I found interesting was that after Witcher and Sergeant Cuff, who's a rather, who also sort of fails in his investigation, um, the detectives tended to be not, the detective heroes of English novels tended not to be working class police detectives, but rather more well-born amateurs, such as Sherlock Holmes. And it was as if the Road Hill case did blight the image of the police detective and the whole issue of which is class and the working class man invading the privacy of the middle class household seemed to have a last and enduring effect and it was much easier to, to cast a a middle class or upper class figure as a detective in order to avoid that particular tension. And it's only, I'd say, in the last 50 years or so that we've returned to having working class police detective figures as heroes in 
uh, novels and television drama. Um, what I think is fascinating about this book, and, and actually perhaps we just have time for you to read the afterword, is that at the heart of it is, is why are we so fascinated by mysteries, by detective stories? And this is something that you're left with at the end of the book. So could you maybe read the afterword? This um, comes at the very end of the book, but doesn't contain any spoilers, <laughs> I think. Um, and it refers uh, the, at the beginning here to a, a book which was one of the first full-length true crime books published, which was by a man called Joseph Stapleton, who was a friend of the father of the murdered boy, and who was a local surgeon who conducted the post-mortem, helped conduct the post-mortem on, on the child's body. The third chapter of Joseph Stapleton's book on the Roadhill murder is devoted to the post-mortem examination of Savile Kent's body. Among the doctor's many observations about the corpse is a description in characteristically florid prose of two wounds on the boy's left hand. But upon the hand, that left hand, that beautifully chiseled hand hanging lifeless from a body that might even in its mutilation, furnish a study and a model for a sculptor. There are two small cuts, one almost down to the bone, the other just a scratch upon the knuckle of the forefinger. How came they there? Stapleton's explanation for these injuries briefly, violently, pulls Savile back into view. From the nature and position of the wounds, the surgeon deduces that the child woke just before he was killed and raised his left hand to fend off the knife striking at his throat. The knife sliced into his knuckle. He lifted his hand a second time, more feebly, and the blade grazed his finger as it cut into his neck. The image makes Savile suddenly present. He wakes to see his killer and to see his death descend on him. When I read Stapleton's words, I was reminded with a jolt that the boy lived. In unraveling the story of his murder, I had forgotten him. Perhaps this is the purpose of dete detective investigations, real and fictional, to transform sensation, horror, and grief into a puzzle, and then to solve the puzzle, to make it go away. The detective story, observed Raymond Chandler in 1949, is a tragedy with a happy ending. A storybook detective starts by confronting us with a murder and ends by absolving us of it. He clears us of guilt. He relieves us of uncertainty. He removes us from the presence of death. Thank you. Um, I just now just for a little bit like to touch on how you wrote the book because of course you're dealing with fact but how much fact did you find? How much of your own imagination did you use? Um, what was your process? Well the process, uh, my, my aim and, um, and, I, and I hope that it's the case is that there's nothing in the book which isn't true or that doesn't have a source. So every bit of dialogue is drawn from newspaper reports of the, tr the various hearings and trials of the case or interviews with the protagonists. So it's, um, it's, in it's entirely factual, but because the book deals also with the, fi the fictional uh, facts of the way that the detective figure was formed and the detective fed into fiction, I've tried to shape the book um, in the form of a detective novel and to, to use the real facts within the structure of a, of a suspenseful 
who done it because that's the form that the story inspired and that I was interested in tracing the origins of. So I, I would say that the, the, the order in which I re relay the facts is, um, I is inspired, influenced, and derived from fiction, but um, the, the content is all factual, or I very much hope it is. <laughs> Um, do we have time for a couple of questions or just about? All right. Are there, we have time maybe for, there's a, a lady there. Yes. From your account, I can get that the way Mr. Witcher worked was there in the file. But what is most important in the fiction, detective fiction, is the personality of the detective. You know his idiosyncrasies, his special characteristics. Now this man was uh, from a very different class, a very different this thing. So that must be a challenge. How did you, was it a real person uh, uh, that you had in mind? Or how did you flesh, it, uh, flesh out the character of a mister? That's all. So um, originally, this book was conceived actually as a biography of Jack Witcher, and it was going to attempt to be a biography that told the story of the man and his life through this one case. Um, and I, I hope that's still there in the book. Um, I worked incredibly hard on researching his life and trying to find out where he came from, what he'd done before. I read about every case I could find that he had previously worked on. Um, in the end, I, I realized that the thing that interested me most was the case and his intersection with it and what, what happened at that moment. Rather, And so his, his biography is still there and I've, I've, um, I felt very close to him uh, because what he was doing in researching the crime. After a while, I came to feel that, that he was a, a sort of a, a version of, of what I was doing in trying to gather every little fact, but also to put them together in a way that in the end did depend on some level of intuition, imagination, and deciding what order to tell the, the, the put, to put the facts together in is in effect what a detective does. He doesn't just gather evidence, he interprets it which is what a nonfiction writer does too. So the, um, the most intimate way in which I sort of put, uh, fleshed them out for myself was just by that process of identification, I think. And I felt, um, I felt very much for him in the years in which he was seen as this terrible failure and upstart, and he became so unhappy that he lost, he went from being the prince of detectives to being the downfall of the, of the entire profession, very triggering. Um, and so it, it's, it's his story in itself is, is a moving story and that's unusual, I think, in, in recorded, in, in you know, the records of, um, of crime to find a detective who has that, who's, whose life is so bound up with what he investigates. So after publishing The Suspicions of Mr. Witcher, Kate went on to write a book called Mrs. Robinson's Disgrace, which is a sort of real-life Madame Bovary, um, a, another absolutely marvelous book. And she's now writing another murder case. So maybe just a tiny little bit about that so we know what to look forward to in the future. Uh, yes, I found when I finished Mr. Witcher, I, I felt I'd uh, written enough about murder and <laughs> that now I found I'm returning to it because I came across this uh, story to me really fascinating from the very end of the 19th century um, about a boy of 13 who killed his mother in the East End of London. And I've... Um, I've nearly come to the end of writing it, <laughs> and I've been um, researching not only the case itself, but what became of this boy afterwards, and um, have found some really surprising and uh, astonishing stories there. Thank you so much, Kate.
Um, her books are enthralling. They're in the bookshop. Do buy them, do read them, and I know she'd be happy to sign copies. So thank you so much for giving us this wonderful account. Thank you, Kate. I know we don't have much time, but that truly was a wonderful speech.